for my purposes here, there's been studies done of functional MRI brain scans of subjects playing the prisoner's dilemma. Emory University, 36 subjects, areas of the brain of cooperators that lit up were the same areas associated response with such stimuli as desserts, money, cocaine, beautiful faces. It's this, it's this uh, area, the an anterior ventral striatum in the middle of the brain, the so-called pleasure center, discovered in the 60s when um, uh, psychologists put uh, electrodes in rats' brains in this area, and they sat there and pressed the, the bar, and they had a choice, the bar that presses, that gives them the little jolt in the pleasure center, little orgasms, I guess, and, and the other bar feeds them, and they'll sit there and starve to death with the food right there. All they have to do is press the bar. No, nope, can't give that up. Uh, that's how powerful this is. This is the area in human brains that's lighting up when subjects are playing prisoner's dilemma and cooperating. Um, and to the orbital frontal cortex related to impulse control and the processing of reward. So the, the actual feel-good reward itself and the thinking about the reward and what it means, both of these are lighting up when uh, subjects are cooperating. Finally, my final point, trust with verification. We don't want to be naive here and think that somehow uh, we're just angels. We're not. Behavioral economics, neuroeconomics, and learning to be in the company of strangers. It's the oddest thing that we do. We interact with complete strangers. This is really unusual in human history. Uh, as Jared Diamond tells me, uh, if you were walking down a path in Papua New Guinea and you came across a stranger, it would be suicide to just stick your hand out and shake, uh, shake his hands and greet and give a, a warm greeting. This is just not normally done. You, don't, you only offer trust when there's extensive verification. How do you, how do you get that between strangers? The, my avenue at it is through Paul Zak's work on oxytocin bonding and trust. Oxytocin, we all know, is the, is the hormone released when, uh, with nursing uh, mothers, and, and it get, gives an incredibly strong bonding, uh, sense of bonding and attachment. Well, we, we know this is actually true under any kind of physical uh, touch between couples, particularly during sex, a uh, big burst of oxytocin, uh, oxytocin during sex. Uh, Zach uh, has actually played this slight variation on the ultimatum game, the you make a split and the other one accepts it or not. The variation is um, where instead of offering one split, and then he can accept it or not. Um, whatever he accepts is going to be, the, the, the responder accepts is going to be tripled in value. So let's say I've got uh, 10 bucks and I offer you two bucks. Whatever I offer you you're, is going to be tripled in value. So now you've got two, four, six dollars. And whatever you offer me back from that is also going to be tripled in value. And we're going to go back and forth like this 10 times. Uh, now, th there's different ways to look at the, the results of this. According to classic economic theory, if we're rational, selfish, maximizing calculators, we should think, okay, this guy is going to probably bail on round nine and take the whole thing. So I'm going to bail on round eight. And I'll, I'll sort of lead him along, and, and then I'll, I'll nail him right there. But wait a minute. If he's anything like me, he's going to be thinking what I'm thinking, so I better bail on round seven, but he'll be bailing on round six, so I better bail on round five. And, and the whole thing would break down, and that isn't what happens. In fact, uh, subjects establish trust by offering small amounts, and then they get, they get larger as, as trust develops. What Zach does is he draws their blood, and he measures the amount of oxytocin and finds out that when su subjects are really cooperating nicely and making a lot of money, these are students, by the way, so they're very motivated, that uh, oxytocin is this feel-good hormone. We finds it, he says, we find that it guides subjects' decisions even when they're unable to articulate why they're acting in a trusting or trustworthy manner. Zach has demonstrated the relationship between oxytocin, trust, and economic prosperity. Trust is among the most powerful factors affecting economic growth, and such trust is directly related to neurological chemicals such as oxytocin. It is vital for national prosperity uh, that the country maximizing social, that the country maximize social interactions among its members, as well as members of other countries. Free trade is one of the most effective means of socializing, as is education, civil liberties, free press, free association. In fact, Zach's got a paper, research paper on this, basically how to create trust nationally. You have to have a reliable infrastructure, roads, telephones. I need, I need to be able to, to uh, know that uh, I can communicate with other people. I can, I can leave my home and reliably get somewhere else. There has to be a rule of law. I, I have to know, I have to be secure and comfortable in knowing that disputes will be settled fairly. There has to be freedom to move about the country, freedom of the press, freedom of association, uh, education of the general populace, protection of civil liberties, a sound banking and monetary system. If you have to keep your money in the mattress, you're not going to feel real trusting and secure about your neighbors. 
Um, and he noticed also a clean environment. Um, in fact, a lot of toxins knock back the effectiveness of oxytocin and dopamine and other hormones like that that increase trust. Um, so to wrap it up, I'm not naive. Uh, I'll end with two little clips from, uh, two little excerpts from movies here. Uh, I do realize we live in a world with walls, and uh, my favorite movie on this subject, especially since 9-11, is uh, the Tom Cruise character grilling, you remember from A Few Good Men, uh, the uh, Jack Nicholson character, uh, Nathan Jessup, and, and this is the famous scene where he says, you know, you can't handle the truth, you know, and all that. But, but, but it was, what, it was what, what was around that that was so interesting, where he says, you know, we live in a world that has walls, and those walls have to be guarded by men with guns. And you don't want the truth because deep down in places you don't talk about at parties, you want me on that wall, and you need me on that wall. And, well, since 9-11, yeah, absolutely. I'm glad to have leatherneck tough Marines on the walls manning the, the station because there are bad people, for sure. But if we take the longer view, the evolutionary or historical perspective, must it always be this way? So uh, I return to Frederick Bastiatz. He was an early sort of classical liberal economist who said, where goods do not cross frontiers, armies will. This is what I call Bastiat's axiom or his corollary, where goods cross frontiers, armies do not. Okay, it's not a perfect law, it's, it's true. Even trading countries invade each other occasionally. But it's one of these generalizations that the more free trade there is and the more happily people are swapping ideas and products across political borders, the less likely armies are to cross. And let's return then at the end finally here to the Yamamano people. They are sophisticated traders in spite of the fact that Napoleon Shagnon called them the fierce people, because they are, they're fierce, they're nasty fighters. But as Shagnon also wrote in his monograph on them, each village has one or more special products that it provides to its allies. These include items such as dogs, hallucinogenic drugs, arrow points, arrow shafts, bows, cotton yarn, cotton and vine hammocks, baskets of several varieties, clay pots, and in the case of contacted villages, steel tools, fish hooks, fish line, and aluminum pots. These would be part of their SKUs, by the way, part of those 300 SKUs. Without these frequent contacts, Shagnon continues, with neighbors, alliances would be much slower in formation and would be even more unstable once formed. A prerequisite to stable alliances, repetitive visiting and feasting, and the trading mechanism serves to bring about these visits. In other words, where goods cross Yanomamo frontiers, Yanomamo armies do not. Okay, not perfect. Yes, there are exceptions, but less likely to happen. So the Yanomamo trade, not because they're innate altruists or nascent capitalists, simply because they want to form political alliances with other groups and trade as an effective means of doing so, such as the potlatch feast, that sort of thing. It requires reciprocity. You get some interaction going between strangers, maybe a little dopamine, oxytocin buildup, trust with verification. Pretty soon we're now allies. We can join together against those other bad guys and so on. This is how it begins. This is how we start the long path toward modern economies. Humans in general practice within group amity and between group enmity. Th this is in our nature. I'm absolutely convinced of it. We're the, the love thy neighbor is true, and usually what it means is your fellow in-group members and kill the bastards on the other side of the river. <laughs> it's all there in the Old Testament. <laughs> That's really what it meant. It meant it's a within-group amity, between-group enmity uh, morality. It makes perfect sense in an evolutionary framework. Free trade builds trust between strangers, making them more like within-group friends instead of between-group enemies. So this is what I call the Starbucks theory of war. <laughs> But if you don't like Starbucks, pick any company. Where Starbucks cross frontiers, armies will not. That is, where products and services cross frontiers, armies are less likely to, let's say. Free trade of products between all peoples and open access to services across geographic borders will make political borders obsolete. Or, if you like, the Google theory of peace, where information and knowledge cross frontiers, armies will not. Free trade of information between peoples, open access to knowledge across geographic borders will make political borders obsolete. I, I think it's one of the great moves, even though Google had to, um, I guess, uh, modify their don't be evil slogan a little bit to get into China. But once you're in there, people will work around those firewalls and, and, and people will find a way. So I'm hopeful. Uh, as uh, Catherine Hepburn said to uh, Humphrey Bogart and the African Queen, nature, Mr. Alnut, is what we were put in this world to rise above. <laughs> Thank you.